intro into me and what holistic veterinary medicine is all about and what kind of things we can achieve with it, just to give you an idea of kind of what, what kind of things we're going to be offering when I start consulting here as well. Um, so I graduated at the Royal Veterinary College in 2012 and I did uh, straight away started a herbal medicine course because um, that's what I'd always wanted to do when I started uni anyway um, and I did that for a couple of years and during that time also did a, an acupuncture course and then from 2015 to 19 I did a homeopathy degree and so that sort of got a little bit of everything in. Um, and I've worked at the two practices I've worked at have both been integrated vet practices. So both of my bosses were human and animal homeopaths and did some acupuncture and I brought herbal medicine to those practices as well. So we were, I've only worked in practices offering a whole selection of different medicines. And then um, in 2019, I set up my own little practice, Holistic Vet Vicky, and I'm in Wiverliscombe, so right on the Somerset Devon border. Um, so what is holistic medicine? I always like to think of it as holistic medicine because it's taking in the whole of the animal rather than just looking at specific bits. So the Oxford Dictionary says it's the treatment of the whole person taking into account mental and social factors rather than just the symptoms of a disease. And to me, what that really means is we're trying to optimise health and encourage efficient functioning of all the systems and all the parts of the body. So trying to get that overall health rather than just no symptoms. So health, like it says here, so Oxford Dictionary says the state of being free from illness or injury. But really, I much prefer this World Health Organization definition, which is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Because you can see a lot of dogs around that people say are healthy, but when you really look into it, you know, how good is the poo? How good is the skin? How good is this? How good can they cope with different upsets? Like, if they eat a dead rabbit in the woods, can they cope with that? Because a healthy dog should be able to. Whereas an unhealthy dog will immediately have a horrendous diarrhea or something. So it's that kind of looking at what you can do to optimise health overall. And I really liked this Deepak Chopra quote. So, to create health, you need a new kind of knowledge based on a deeper concept of life. So it's looking that level below just basic health. And then what's disease? So it's dis-ease. The body's no longer at ease with itself. Something isn't quite working right in there. So we've got a disorder of structure or function in a human, animal, or plant, especially one that produces specific symptoms or that affects a specific location and is not simply a direct result of physical injury. And what it's always worth remembering is that disease is not symptoms. So diarrhea is not disease. The disease is whatever has caused the diarrhea like itchy skin in your dog, that's not a disease. It's the atopic skin disease, the allergy underneath that that's creating those symptoms. So with holistic medicine, what we're doing is we're having a totally different approach to the case. So if you have a holistic case, a holistic consult with a holistic vet, then you have usually an hour long, at least, for your first consult, and you talk about everything. So you talk about their personality, their likes and dislikes, uh, you know, even things like, do they like it to be warmer or cooler? Um, what foods do they particularly like or dislike? Will they go out in every weather? And then you talk about the disease, what makes their symptoms better or worse? Is it worse in the summer or the winter? Is it worse in the morning or the evening? It's that talking about absolutely everything. It's a completely different approach. And we have different expectations because we're working with the body to heal itself. So it's not like you give a steroid and the itching stops. That, you know, it does work like that in many cases, but that's also doing other things. So if you're trying to treat holistically, you're getting a much slower, more kind of with the body kind of approach to healing. The body doesn't heal instantly. If you cut yourself, it takes some time to heal. Same with how you're going to approach the disease. You don't get instantaneous results, although you can in some cases. Um, we're also trying to aim for a cure over suppressing symptoms. So particularly skin cases, they're constantly suppressed by conventional medicine. That's the only way we really have with conventional medicine to treat them. You just suppress the immune system, that suppresses the disease, and therefore the symptoms go away temporarily. What we're trying to do is actually cure. And it's not always possible because sometimes you've got lots of layers of disease, layers of suppression and things like that. But that's our aim. Ideally, that's what we want to try and achieve. We can also treat things without an official diagnosis. Sometimes lots of tests will be done and still something isn't right about the animal, but we don't know what it is. 
And that's fine, we can still treat that because we're going on what's slightly disturbed within the animal. They're a bit low, let's give them something to give them a boost. Let's support the immune system. Let's do something to alleviate whatever the symptom is. So you don't need a specific diagnosis, although it obviously can be helpful sometimes. So we want to support the body in health as well as disease. So a lot of what we call healthcare is actually disease care. It's not at all healthcare. You know, like the doctors aren't offering you healthcare. They're not advising you on how to be healthy. They're trying to treat disease. But we're trying to actually advise on health. So we see a lot of patients for health advice rather than treating their disease. And that's always a joy to do because you see so many cases at such a low end stage of their disease that there's much less you can do. Whereas if you can get in before anything's happened, you can make huge differences to the amount of disease that pet might have in their lifetime. And we're combining different medical approaches to find the most effective management for that specific individual. So sometimes it is conventional medicine. Sometimes they need those antibiotics or a short dose of steroids or anti-inflammatories, but other times we can avoid them, and we try to. And these two at the bottom, these are my little mottos that I've always had as a vet, because I think they're super important, which is meddle at your peril, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I specifically like to apply those to neutering, and things like that, because you are meddling when you remove a sex organ from an animal, and you don't know what that's going to do. So if you've not got a good reason to do it, don't do it. And it's a really nice way to think about each different thing you might do with your pet. Am I meddling? Is this necessary? Have I got something broken that I'm trying to fix? Or am I just doing something that maybe I should just leave be? Okay, so natural feeding. Um, if uh, at uni, as a vet, you get very little education on diet. We had two lectures. One of them was from Hills, and that was just talking about their food. And one of them was from a clinician who's done a lot of work, sponsored by Hills, who taught us nutrition in disease. And his lectures basically just taught us what they remove and add to the different diet foods that you can give as prescription diets. And that was all we were taught, two one-hour lectures. It was absolutely horrendous. I can't believe that's all anyone's ever taught, and I really hope it's not like that anymore. Um, so vets have to do their own research into it, so I just did masses of reading, and luckily in the practices where I worked, we did raw feeding. So I was able to then work on educating myself through using it in my practices. Um, and obviously, when you look at human health, nutrition is a huge thing within that. So why is that not applied on to pets? And it's amazing how once you point that out to lots of people, they suddenly click like, why, if I eat healthily, why am I not feeding my dog a healthy food? And it suddenly all seems to slot into place when it didn't before. Um, and these are my favorite quotes relating to food. So obviously you are what you eat. If you eat healthy food, you're gonna be much healthier. Um, and let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And probably my favorite one is this one. Because if we do eat wrongly, no doctor can cure us. And if we eat rightly, no doctor is needed. And I think that's so essential because some animals, you sort the diet, that's it. All their disease symptoms are gone. It can be absolutely incredible. And it can last for their entire life. And you can never need anything else. This is my old boy fudge that I lost in 2009. But he was my first raw feeding case uh, before I was even a proper qualified vet. Uh, so he's my raw feeding case that I'm going to share with you because it was really eye-opening for me, this particular, obviously it's my own dog, um, so it's, you can notice every single nuance of that change that the diet has in them. So um, when I changed his diet, he was three years old, male neutered border collie, um, he'd been kibble fed, good quality kibble but still kibble, um, and had variable stools, so they used to start firm and then get softer towards the end, or the second poo of the day would be softer. So those are kind of classic colitis symptoms. So you've got a bit of inflammation in the colon, and it's just causing a slight little upset within the guts. And ideally, you should have perfect poos all the time. That's what you're aiming for. Um, he would get occasional diarrhea, sometimes overnight, itchy skin, especially the pores would lick them a lot, sometimes get hot spots. Um, and he had a chronic inflammatory issue from an osteochondritis dissecans lesion in his shoulder um, and a few other inflammatory issues within the shoulder. So he had an arthroscopy when he was about two, but still had awful bouts of lameness. 
um, and needed anti-inflammatories from time to time. This was before I knew better, so I was just doing what we were being taught. Um, and the next step I was told, because it wasn't resolving, was intra-articular steroid injections. And this is obviously only a three-year-old dog, so the idea of doing that was not, not one I was too keen on. So we switched him to raw, um, and his coat became so shiny and his skin so great that numerous people, it was quite incredible, would be commenting on his coat. Wow, your dog's coat is so shiny. And they always say, what do you feed him? Because they know, it's like instinctively, they know that the food must be the reason why the skin is so shiny and the coat is so good. Um, no itching, just he was a very meticulous dog, like Collie sometimes are, so he would clean his paws meticulously, but not excessive. Um, and he only ever had one other hot spot in his entire lifetime from an insect bite or sting or something on his leg while we were on a walk. Um, perfect poos all the time, even if he ate something dodgy. Had amazing teeth, never ever required a dental. Never required any more medication for his shoulder. No more anti-inflammatories. We just managed with occasional resting days or shorter walks or lead walks until he was 10. And then I added in um, a little herbal anti-inflammatory mix and sort of aging mix just to kind of support him while he was aging. Um, and that helped with any kind of on-off lameness that we were starting to see. Um, and minimised all the inflammation. And he had developed a little spondylitis, um, but it never caused him any grief because we were just managing things. I ended up losing him um, at 11. He had this awful bone tumour in his jaw. This was quite near the end. You can see it was taking up this whole area. Um, we managed that. So bone tumours and mouth tumours are particularly terrible tumours. And usually from diagnosis, a bone tumour will be about two to three months before they're put to sleep um, because they can be incredibly painful and cause a lot of issues. Mouth tumours the same. We managed him, um, made him up some herbs, did some homeopathy, uh, medicinal mushroom complex. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, medicinal mushrooms are things like reishi, cordyceps, chaga, um, like a traditional Chinese medicine based mushroom and they're really potent immunomodulators so amazing for the immune system and particularly good for cancer so I put all cancer cases I see onto a medicinal mushroom complex um, and there's some breeds of dog like Burmese mountain dogs that I think it would be a great because they're so prone to cancer these certain breeds that would be the sort of thing you could supplement throughout your dog's life if you had a cancer prone breed so flat coat retrievers, boxers, fernies, those sorts of breeds. Um, he did need some antibiotics on and off, especially at the end, but any tumour in the mouth, that's quite normal for. The mouth's quite a dirty place, they've got to chew, they end up, he carried on eating his raw throughout, and obviously a bit of bone might, you know, stab into the tumour, because you can see it was taking up a huge amount of his mouth. People thought he was carrying a tennis ball or something when he was just walking along, bless him. He never needed any pain relief. I tried it, it didn't make any difference. He obviously wasn't that painful. And he was still absolutely loving life right until the end. And I managed to buy him uh, about six and a half months from diagnosis, just from using holistic medicine. And he just absolutely loved life all the way till the end. And it just started bleeding and that's what, what decided it for us. And there wasn't much I could do about that. But that just sort of shows you how much diet can make a difference. The shoulder particularly, I was flabbergasted by, you know, who would have thought that a dog that could have been on intra-articular steroid injections every six months from three could never need anything, and except some herbs from 10 years old. I mean, I just thought that was amazing. Um, so herbal medicine, that's uh, one of the other main things I did. It was the first thing I chose to do, and one of the reasons for that is because I love the idea that herbal medicine can be practiced anywhere. So you're walking in the woods, there's herbs all around you, something happens, you've got herbs there. You know, they are everywhere. And the more you get to know different herbs, and maybe at some point we can do a more specific herb-based talk, but you start to get much more involved in your environment because you're out walking your dog and you see all these different herbs and you know what they can do to help and you suddenly get involved in the environment and much more and the passing of the seasons because you can see all these herbs passing through. And that's why I chose herbal medicine first. Um, so it's using plants or their extracts as medicine and it is the oldest form of medicine because we evolved alongside plants and you know there's evidence from cave people of their use of of different medicinal plants that have been found when they've been found. 
Um, like I said, it can be practiced anywhere and everywhere. Uh, and in the way it works, it can be quite similar in the, in the way that drugs work. So you have antimicrobial her uh, herbs and you have anti-inflammatory herbs and they have that sort of anti-action like drugs would do but they're obviously doing it in a much more natural way working with the system rather than just cancelling everything out so in a herbal action where you might have an antibiotic or antimicrobial with herbs you often have what they call a <coughs> microbial modulator so it adjusts the bacteria levels in the body rather than just wiping out everything it goes, right, this is a bit high, let's try and juggle everything about to level it all out again. Um, and the, so that kind of gives it this greater depth and breadth of action, because you've got, in one herb, you might give it for one thing, but it can cause a whole load of other things. And one of my favourites was that I gave my dad some herbs for something completely unrelated, and he had this funny precancerous spot thing that the doctor had been monitoring, it completely went away. Unrela I wasn't treating that, I was treating something completely different and it just disappeared from his head and it was amazing. Um, generally, no adverse effects from herbs, obviously like anything, sometimes you might get a bit of diarrhoea if your dog reacts to that specific herb, but it's fairly unusual but does happen. Um, you've got no chemical residues, no environmental pollution. So you've got Western and Eastern, so traditional Chinese medicine. Um, I mostly do Western herbal medicine but I do sometimes dabble with a few Chinese herbs and some of the Chinese herbs I use a lot. But I have, there are certain Chinese formulas and they're called things like Gui Tang Yu and all these fascinating names. Um, but there are a lot of uh, TCM practitioners and you can find vets that are doing TCM. There's a few really great ones in this country around the place. And the herbs themselves, we tend to use teas, tinctures, they're most common, sometimes powdered herbs. Um, creams, balms, also very common, and those are often either made up pre-made, you can buy them pre-made, or they can be quite easy to make up yourself. Um, infused oils, poultices, and obviously fresh, which you can just add into the food and use in a kind of supplemental way, as well as a medicinal way. So when you're giving herbs, what we're trying to do is we're creating a herbal formula, so put together a herbal recipe, and we're going to have one or more herbs, and we want to resolve the major clinical signs <coughs> of complaint, we want to support any other signs or systems in need. We want to reduce the adverse effects or work synergistically with other herbs. For example, if you've got a very warming herb, so like ginger or turmeric or something like that, you want to make sure that in your mix you've also got quite a cooling herb, so like nettle or dandelion or something like that, to balance it out so you don't get the patient getting overly hot. And I've seen that where I've added a, war a warming herb to a mix and haven't balanced it enough and suddenly the dog's panting every evening or something. You take it away, panting stops. So it can be remarkable the effect that they can have. Um, and obviously reduce adverse effects of all work synergistically with the conventional medicine. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can use the herbs to help you reduce the amount of conventional medicines you're needing or just to reduce any side effects you might be seeing. So especially with things like chemotherapy, which can have really bad side effects, the herbs will often help alleviate that so that both treatments can work much better together than one or the other would alone. And obviously strengthen the body as a whole. And when we're making up herbs, you can either have a very simple herb mix, so one or two herbs, or you can have a very complex one that's got masses of herbs to treat lots of different things. Um, and the simple mixes as well versus the complex, so some animals come and they have one problem, so they're very anxious or fearful or nervous, so all the herbs in their mix are going to be calming herbs, or along that sort of vein. Or you might have an elderly dog that has arthritis and a liver problem and its kidneys aren't very good and its eyesight's not very good and its breathing's not very good and everything's going a little bit wrong and so you have a little bit of everything that just sort of supports and nudges it along to the best health you can hope to get in that kind of case. When you're feeding them, there's lots of different ways to give them. So you can give it in just in the normal food and I find my raw fed dogs never have a problem getting herbs into them. They just wolf it all down. Kibble fed dogs, much harder. Kibble's not exciting enough to, to mask the herbiness, but teas can work quite well in kibble. Um, so you can mix it into special or exciting food, so like nut butters or smelly food, like tinned fish, something like that to mask the smell of it, or yogurt, kefir, bone broth, something like that. 
Um, and in worst case scenario, if you really need to be treating, then you can always mix with the bone broth or something and syringe it in, because you only need quite a small amount of the herb. So say it was a teaspoon of herb, you could just have the teaspoon of herb, the five mil, plus the five mil of bone broth, and then you've only got to get 10 mil in, which isn't too difficult in, in an average size dog. Um, and I have managed with some very prissy animals, particularly cats, where you can just sort of smear it on them, mixed with something, and then they have to lick it off, which they don't like, but it works very well. <laughs> so this um, is a little herb case. Um, so this is Daisy. She's a three-year-old miniature schnauzer, and she had severe noise phobia. So it got to the point where the owners literally could not leave the house with her. She wouldn't go for a walk, she wouldn't go in the garden. It had got absolutely horrendous. Walking was basically impossible. They kept trying because they knew they needed to take her out, but she was not happy and dragged the entire way to try and get home. Um, they tried various conventional supplements and different supportive things, but nothing had any effect. So we started her on a calming herb mix. So we had things like uh, ashwagandha, which is calming, but it's also an adaptogen. So it helps support the whole system and helps it to deal better with stress. So it has that kind of two-sided action. And then passion flower, skull pack, chamomile, really well-known, nice calming herbs, nice and soothing. And when you're using herbs, you often find that within the first two weeks, you get to see the beginning of the action but they actually build up in the system to a maximum effect at around six to eight weeks. So you only get that little jump first, and then over time, you get further and further moving forwards with the case. Um, so after two weeks on the herbs, and we also had introduced a new training program, they'd had a trainer behaviorist lady go over, give them some different exercises and things to be doing with her. Um, and even just after that two weeks, she was a completely different dog, much more content, much more able to deal with life um, and after eight weeks she was almost completely normal I was coming up for fireworks night so we did her some emergency herbs so this is really some of the most potent of the calming herbs so I think hers was probably valerian and Jamaican dogwood or something like that um, and she coped fantastically for a noise phobic dog um, and shooting season came they managed to walk her without any problems and now she doesn't need any herbs and she doesn't have that noise phobia anymore. They man we managed to use the herbs to turn down the fear enough that they could retrain her to know that those sounds weren't so frightening. And that just, you know, that's the kind of case where with conventional medicine you often just don't have the ability to help it other than giving them some kind of sedative for the actual fireworks night or something like that. So the other thing I do um, a lot is homeopathy, um, and uh, homeopathy is based on this principle, let likes be cured by likes. So it was developed by a guy called Samuel Hahnemann in the 19th century, um, and it's a complex system of medicine based on the idea that disease in an organism may be cured by administering a substance that would induce similar sy symptoms if given repeatedly to a healthy individual. So this is how they work out how, what each remedy can help with. You repeatedly give it to a healthy individual and what, whichever symptoms they produce are symptoms that you can cure with that remedy. And what the correct remedy does, so if the perfect remedy is found to match your pet or the patient, then it stimulates the vital force in the body to help it to heal itself. And the way you create a remedy is the substances are diluted and succussed, which means they're basically just like knocked about really hard to create a sort of vortex and agitate the mixture. Um, and that means that even toxic substances can be used as medicines because they've been diluted so much. And the water, the, the theory behind it is that the water retains a memory of the energy of whatever that substance was that it was made from without the physical substance remaining. And I don't know if anyone's read any of Masaru Emoto's work, so it's a, a Japanese guy and he looked into water and how the way you treat water can affect it. And he studied it under different microscopes um, and so the, this rather beautiful looking one was one which they would say love to repeatedly, whereas this one was something like, I hate you and I want to kill you and they would say that to the water every day. And that's how they appeared under the microscope. And there's this whole series of images, and it's quite fascinating. And with homeopathy, the more diluted the medicine, the more potent the effects. 
So if you see any remedies, most of the ones you'll see in the shop will be something like a 30C. Um, and then it will go up in potency to like a 200C, a 1M. And actually the 1M is much stronger than the 30C or the 12C or the 6C. So as it gets higher, it gets more potent, but more dilute. So with each remedy, you've got this symptom picture, which is based on its proving, which was when the remedy was given repeatedly. So it can include physical, mental, and emotional symptoms, systemic ones, so affecting the whole body, local ones, and general ones. The symptom picture that most closely matches the symptoms displayed by the patient is what you're trying to select. So if you ever have a homeopathic consult, you end up getting asked all kinds of bizarre questions and going into all kinds of odd detail because we need to get to the root of who the pet is, who are they, what are they all about, and how does their disease affect them? Because each disease affects each individual differently. You know, an itchy dog, each itchy dog is different. Some of them are worse for the heat, some are worse for the cold. And it's all of those things that make them an individual and that help you choose that remedy picture. So why choose homeopathy? So we've got no adverse side effects. I've never had a, an adverse side effect from a homeopathic remedy. You can get something called an aggravation. So if you get a really good remedy, sometimes it gets temporarily worse. So itchy dogs particularly, you often see that. They might be a little bit more itchy for three days, maybe a week, but that's usually a good sign. It means the remedy's done something, it's stimulated the system, and the aggravation should then calm, and they should then improve with the itching afterwards. So you don't get any of the suppression of symptoms for later reappearance, like you might get with steroids or something. You're taking into account all the symptoms, not just whatever fits the diagnosis. So you know, they might have diarrhea, but they might also be depressed with it, or they might be taking themselves away from the family, or they might be more irritable with other dogs and snapping when they're having an episode. And we're looking at all of that and trying to help it, rather than just trying to stop the diarrhea. And Patient individuality, like we just discussed, it's all about that. Um, and again, no environmental pollution or chemical residues. So how are we curing the disease? So what the remedy is trying to do is to create within the body the disease, but in an energetic form. So it's trying to mimic it. And that way it takes over the body, but then because it's just a remedy and it's energy, it fades away and the disease itself is no longer there because the remedy's taken over instead. And that's kind of like the theory behind it. Sounds a bit wishy-washy, but when you see it work, it can be absolutely incredible. So this is one of my little homeopathy cases. He was only treated with homeopathy because it was a, a case from abroad. Um, so it's a 14-year-old male entire mini Maltese, and he had chronic renal failure. And the raised kidney values were found about six months before I saw the dog. Um, and he hadn't had many symptoms for those six months, but he'd had a huge crash, and for the two weeks before I spoke to the lady, he'd been vomiting profusely, barely eating anything, needing um, fluids under the skin two to three times a week. He was very weak and tired, very slow, not going for any walks at all. Kidney values were much, much worse, and both the owner and the vets thought that he was dying, and this was a last ditch attempt of whether we could do anything. And if he did pull through, the owner had been told by two different vets, because she'd sought a second opinion, that he wouldn't survive six months with the blood values that he had at that time. So we took his case and chose his remedy. So his remedy was Nat Muir, 30C. And we also did him a kidney support mix, homeopathic one as well. So Carduus is milk thistle, Draxicum is dandelion, and Berberus is Berberus. Um, but they, so those are herbs, but you can get them made up into a homeopathic form as well. So for kidney cases, I will frequently do that because they're one of the main symptoms you get with kidney problems is they don't want to eat. So if you put fine tasting herbs in their food, they're even less likely to eat. So that's where the homeopathic remedies can be really useful because they're basically just completely flavorless. So it's very easy to administer even to very fussy dogs. So we got him on some bone broth to get lots of hydration and nutrients going in. We got um, only white meat proteins. So if anyone's had a liver or kidney disease patient before or pet before, then you stick with the white meat proteins because they're much more digestible. And you try and feed little and often so that the organ, whether it's the kidney or the liver, has much less to deal with at one time. So lots of little meals. It's much easier to get it all down than one big meal once a day or something like that. 
and it was in whatever form he would eat. That was what we opted for because he was eating so little. So six days later, he was eating better, all home-cooked food, had better energy levels. So I didn't hear from her for six months, and I assumed he must have died because, you know, he'd been given six months at that time. And then I got an email from her, and she said, still going strong, good energy levels, very bright, occasional dipping himself for his appetite, an occasional episode of vomiting or diarrhea, but she would give another dose of his remedy, and he would perk up again every time. Carried on eating his home-cooked food and taking his support remedy, and the month before, he'd had an accident where I think he fell from a first-floor window or something, and <laughs> it sounded awful, and he recovered absolutely fine. Like, remarkably so. <laughs> and he was actually put to sleep. She emailed me to let me know in October this year. He was 18, and it was 14 months after I'd first seen him, and he'd been given six months to live. So he did absolutely incredibly, just with homeopathy and a few little tweaks. So most of what I end up doing is integrated medicine. So we're combining a little bit of everything. So we're looking at diet, we're looking at herbs, we're looking at homeopathy, and we're seeing what of those can help with each individual case. And that way I find you get the optimum effect. So you're taking the best of every form of medicine, and that includes those conventional medicines. So I think a lot of owners who are into holistic medicine can sometimes end up getting a block on wanting to give any conventional medicine. And it, there's no need to completely block it all. It still has its place, and it can be essential and necessary to get your case to the next level, which you can then help with. And I, do, I use all of these things still, or I send owners back to their regular vets to get them, because they are very useful medications. Each patient's individual, so something different will work for each one, and you don't always find the first thing that's going to work straight away. You do sometimes have to experiment and keep on trying. And like I mentioned earlier, sometimes the disease is so strong or has been treated for so long that maybe all you can get is to lower the dose rate of the conventional drugs or improve quality of life or something like that. Like my dog with the bone tumour. Bone tumours are so aggressive that the chance of you being able to do much more than just help quality of life is very slim. Where there, whereas there are other things that you can achieve a full cure on. And gut and skin, those sometimes you can do. Others, it depends how long it's been going on, but it, it is possible. So we're promoting health whilst treating the disease. And the best cases for these are the ones where conventional medicine has very little to offer. So behaviour cases, ATP or allergies, autoimmune or immune-mediated diseases, ageing, there's very little to support older dogs although more supplements are available now. Um, idiopathic conditions. So idiopathic is where we don't actually know what's caused it. So you don't have anything specific to treat. Um, conditions without a diagnosis, like we mentioned, cancer, stress, chronic organ dysfunction, so liver, kidneys, heart, and a lack of health, but not necessarily a disease. And I see quite a lot of those, because the owner knows they're not right, but the vets can't find anything wrong with them. But the owner wants to do something because they don't want to just sit and watch their dog not being right and not have anything to be able to help with. So those are all great cases for holistic medicine. So I've got now a couple of cases of holistic medicine. So this is a super simple case um, and this was one that was just done on a, a half hour consult um, because the, uh, at the time I didn't have room to see the lady in the time she needed to be seen and it was a much older dog. So we've had an over 15 year old male neutered Yorkie over a year's history of a chronic choking cough, sometimes with retching, sometimes he would bring up phlegm. No other respiratory symptoms or issues with breathing. Been heavily investigated by the conventional vet, so x-rays, I think he had a bronchoalveolar lavage where you flush through the lungs and look at what cells come out. Lots of different treatments tried, steroids, anti-inflammatories, cough suppressants but no long-term change with any of them. Maybe a temporary improvement, but still coughing a lot. It was suspected to be an inflammatory issue, but steroids and anti-inflammatories made very little difference. Otherwise, pretty healthy dog, little bit of arthritis to be expected in a 15-year-old, um, and a slightly enlarged prostate. Um, and we, what we gave him was some marshmallow root powder, and marshmallow root is a demulcent herb. 
So that means it um, forms a gelatinous paste when you mix it with water and it coats the lining of the mucous membranes and helps to soothe any inflammation. So it's great for respiratory or GI problems, um, so uh, gastrointestinal problems. Um, and it also acts as a prebiotic, so it's going to feed all the good bacteria in the colon because it's got insoluble fibre in it. So we gave that with a little bit of yoghurt or a little bit of his food at least 10 to 15 minutes before the meal. So it was going in separately so it could then coat the throat and have its nice soothing action in the throat separate to all of the rest of the food so it wasn't getting lost. And from the case taking I gave him coccus cacti, homeopathic remedy in a 30C. And two weeks later I heard back from the owner, she was very pleased. He was now only coughing a little bit first thing in the morning, no more coughing overnight or at all in the daytime. And four weeks after that, cough had completely gone. And I heard from her recently again, so that was eight months on, and he's had no treatment recently, and he was just starting to do a little bit of throat clearing. So we resumed his treatment again, so restarted his remedy and his marshmallow, and the cough went away again. So that's a cough almost completely gone away for a little dog, just with a very simple treatment, one herb, one remedy. And it can, in these cases, it's so rewarding because it's such a simple way to treat and it's very cheap. Like I think the marshmallow root powder, the size for her dog would have been five pounds and the remedy 10 pounds. So for 15 pounds of treatment, you can cure a cough that she's already spent hundreds of pounds investigating and trying to treat. So it is quite incredible. This is one of my really complex cases. Um, so this is actually a friend's dog. He's called Hamish, and he's absolutely gorgeous. He's a five-year-old male muted lurcher that she rescued. He's had a really tough life. Um, and when I saw him, he'd been recently diagnosed with an extradural spinal mass. So that means it's outside of the middle of the spine, where the spinal cord runs. So it's outside of that rather than intradural, which would be inside that. So it was at L3 to 4, which is... <coughs> So the lumbar vertebrae are the bits, these bits between the ribs <coughs> and the pelvis. So it was between the third and the fourth of those. Um, and it was assumed to be lymphoma or a multiple myeloma, compressing the spinal cord. So the way we'd built up to it, so a month before the diagnosis, he just had a slow time at his lure racing. Um, and the owner had found a few trigger points in the muscles and thought he looked a little bit sore. Went to the physio a couple of times, assuming it was a soft tissue injury, but after the second session, he seemed much worse, so she went straight to the vets, got some gabapentin, so that's nerve pain relief. Um, and two days later, no change, and he was now starting to slope in his spine, crouching in the hind limbs, really struggling with moving around. So went to the referral vets for an MRI, and that's where they obviously found this mass. No metastasis, so no spread anywhere else in the body, but because it was in the spine and because they suspected it to be one of these two tumours, which are both very aggressive tumour types, he was given about a month to live if the owner opted out of chemotherapy by the vet. Um, so she opted out of chemo, SEAT, which is often what people know of as a traditional cancer remedy. Um, but so uh, alternative and cleansing herbs, so it helps the body to get rid of any extra toxins or anything in the system. We had some turmeric in there, probably one of the most famous herbs, great for cancer, great for inflammation, really potent antioxidant, fantastic herb. Um, and some milk thistle for um, really potent antioxidant action, overall support on the system while we're on some quite strong drugs, so particularly for the liver while we're taking steroids and gabapentin and things like that. And we just made a few tweaks to his raw diet. He already had the raw diet. But in a cancer case with a raw diet, what you often try and do is increase the fat in the diet and remove anything carby. So if you've got any carby vegetables or anything like that in, take those out and you up your fat content. Um, and it's basically creating a ketogenic diet like some people do. And there's a centre in America, um, I think it's called Keto Pet. Um, yeah, there we go, Keto Pet. Um, and they've basically been studying the ketogenic diet for cancer in pets. And it's, yeah, a raw diet is almost ketogenic. You just add a bit of extra fat and make sure they're exercising really well. And that helps to starve the cancer while still feeding the animal itself. So we did a few little tweaks to his diet to make it a little bit closer to being ketogenic. So within 48 hours, he was able to walk and trot unsupported, but he was a little wobbly. And I'm not going to pretend that that was mine. I suspect that was the steroids. 
Um, but within three months, we managed to get off the paracetamol, off the gabapentin. He was moving very well, but we were having to balance how much he was allowed to do because he did get quite tired on those back legs. So we're now over a year on. He's down to 10 milligrams of steroid a day when he was on 25 milligrams twice a day. Um, and we're trying to wean off at the moment. So every month or so, we're dropping down by another five milligram. <coughs> And he is doing amazingly well. He has no symptoms. You would not know that there is anything going on in his spine at all. You could do an MRI, see if there's something there. I would love it if she did an MRI because then we could see what's actually happening in the spine. Is it there? Has it gone? Was it one of those tumours? Was it not? What, what's happening? But all the specialists in the referral hospital were sure it was a tumour. They didn't have any other option for what it could have been. Um, but he's living a completely normal life. And for a dog given a month to live, to be here for another Christmas when she thought she wouldn't get that first Christmas, I just think he's a, a little miracle dog. So those are my little cases. And then I thought you guys could just ask any questions about your dogs, about anything we've talked about, about feeding. <laughs> <laughs> So the medicinal mushrooms, great for allergies, okay. um, because of the immunomodulating action. Where you have any kind of allergic condition, it's basically um, the body reacting abnormally to something that is a normal substance. So it's an overreaction by the immune system to something very normal. So what your immunomodulators do is they try and modulate that response to try and calm it down, while at the same time boosting the immune system to help minimise the risk of secondary infections or anything like that. So they're really good. Um, and then lots of kind of uh, anti-allergy, anti-inflammatory type herbs can also be really useful. And improving the quality of the skin as a barrier is super important. So that's where if you get the diet right, improve the quality of the skin, improve the quality of the coat. Um, so that's where when I mentioned oily fish earlier, yeah. if you can tolerate yeah, the oily yeah, fish, yeah, sure. then that's lots of omega-3s, really good for the skin and the coat, also anti-inflammatory. So they can be really, really useful. So would you, did I hear you right and say you would do a mixture? You could use homeopathic as well as herbal, or would you, or would you go in a little bit of So usually in, a, in an allergy case, like we talked about earlier, yeah. the first thing I would do is the diet. Yeah. Because it can make a massive difference. Yeah. And so see what you can do with just the diet. Yeah. And then when you know what's left, once you've sorted yeah. out the diet, then you can go, right, what do we try next? And then I'll often do, you know, a herbal thing. So, for example, like a mushroom complex with a homeopathic remedy. Yeah. Right, what can we do yeah. with that? Yeah. And then see how that goes for a couple of months yeah. and then look to create a herbal mix. But if you're just looking for something to alleviate an itch temporarily, one of my favourite things is chamomile tea. It's ridiculously simple. <laughs> yeah, and with the pores, if that's what's most itchy for him, when he gets back from a walk, wash off the pores, dunk each one in a pot, mug of cool chamomile tea, and then it will allow it to dry, and it's really soothing, it's anti-allergy, it's anti-itch, you can bathe the groin with it, you can put it in a spray bottle and spray the whole dog and brush it through, it's great. Would you give that like also as like a tea then, potentially? Yeah, so you can feed it as a tea as well, and then have, so anything that's left over from your cleaning or spraying, you can add to their food. Um, and it has those actions internally as well. Chamomile is an incredible herb. I use it masses. It's one of my favourites. And it's so safe. It's so mild. There's so many different cases that you can give it to. And it can have amazing effects. Um, and great for the guts as well. So, I mean, like anything, even if it's natural, people can have reactions. I know that. Yeah. Uh, but just quickly, with the skin thing, is nettle tea? Do you find that quite a safe? Yeah, so nettle's another great herb for skin cases. Um, natural antihistamine, really rich in quercetin. Um, I use that a lot in skin cases. And I often find if it's an environmental allergy, so like pollens or grasses or anything like that, then the local nettles will be more effective than like a nettle supplement you might buy. So if you've got nettles in your garden, you can pick those 
dry or use fresh and make tea. And you can feed the nettle as well. You don't just have to give the tea. You can chop up the nettle and it acts like a vegetable. It's really rich in nutrients, nettle, especially iron and things like that. It's a really good nutritive herb. So yeah, and as a starter, nettle and chamomile would be a great place to start and you could do that in tea form. Yeah. I'm interested in the idea of the tea really, I think that would be good as well. Yeah. I think you'll take that and use a little bit to make a difference. And with the tea, if you're trying to get your dog to take some tea in their food, what I recommend people do is make a concentrated shot of tea. So don't make like a whole mug of tea like you might drink. Because <laughs> then it's just going to be all sloppy in their bowl. <laughs> but make it like it's a, they're going to do a little shot of tea. <laughs> And then it's just much more concentrated and you can easily mix it in without putting them off their food. But chamomile is such a popular tea amongst dogs that I had one chronic gut case where, because they had to give the chamomile tea every day, they would just brew a load and leave it in the water bowl for the dog to drink instead of water. And from then on it wouldn't drink water, it only wanted chamomile tea. <laughs> I mean, take it out for a month or, or a few weeks yeah. and see if you notice a difference in the panting. But what if you, if you, because of this, because of the food anti-inflammatory side of it and, and anti-cancer stuff, what would you put with it then? If, it, if, it, if you wanted to continue, if, would you put something alongside it to kind of counteract it? So if you wanted an anti-inflammatory action that was also cooling, then you could do something like boswellia or celery seed. Those are both very cooling herbs, but also have really good anti-inflammatory action for joints. And it's just something that's just going to balance out that warmth. Because ginger and turmeric I use a lot for joint problems, but I have to balance it with something else. Yeah. And uh, the most common, I think, thing that I use for joint problems is a herbal complex tablet, and it's turmeric, boswellia, celery seed, and ginger. So, okay. so per they've designed it to be perfectly balanced yeah. with the cooling and the warming to match each other. So yeah, that's what I would probably do. I mean, I'd go tomato sauce though. That's what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, tomato sauce. Yeah. What's the oil? Yeah. Because the oil is usually sunflower oil, yeah. and that's not a great oil. There's no real benefit of sunflower oil for dogs. Yeah, whereas the tomato, I think, is much better. Otherwise, you could be adding a bit too much oil, and it's not, it not being a good oil to add. So yeah, I'd go tomato sauce, or like raw sprats and just use them in a, a raw form because they're still an oily fish, it doesn't have to be a tinned form. Would you say you're doing consultations from here? Yeah, so from January, mm -hmm. the first Tuesday? Yeah. yeah, first Tuesday of every month, I'm going to be consulting from here. Might be a long day for you, but I'm going to start <laughs> And all bookings are going through Caroline, so okay. anyone who wants to book, they just need to call here. Yeah, it's interesting what you were talking about with the tumours, because I had that as well with the puppy up here in the end. She had a um, bone tumour in her back, same leg that Scoot is missing, my dog. Um, she is back. Left, you look, at, you look at her lots as well. Yeah, left yeah, or right? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, one of the back legs, and she had this, and the vet said maybe three months ish. She was six, and she said three months ish. And at the time, I was doing my nutritional therapy training, so I was full of ideas, as you can imagine. And um, we ended up using, she was already on raw, but we ended up using um, Graviola Gravison, which um, at the time, it was way before the EU changed the supplement rules, so you had a lot more okay. scope of what you could get hold of. It's difficult to get hold of that now. 
but we had that and we read about it being this success story with what it does is it localizes cancer so it can be cut out so it stops the spread it doesn't take it away but it stops the spreading so we thought well we haven't got you know anything to lose so we started giving it to coffee life goes on as it does and we thought has it been three months it must have been three months and it had been nearly four and we thought okay so the lump is as big as ever she was still limping because it's there you know yeah, yeah. maybe limp whether it was painful or not anyway so we took her to the vet and the vet said well i don't know what you've done but i could take a leg i could take that part of her leg away and it is it's fine it's not spread to any of her gynecological area that they thought it would do and yes yeah, she lived till she was nine so we got three years instead of she actually did die of spleen cancer in the end, yeah. but she was nine, and she only really had presenting symptoms of that for the last three months of her life. She may have felt something before, but obviously you can't tell. They can't tell you. So, yeah. So it is pretty amazing if you I get think the right thing. very poorly understood, and oh, the absolutely. treatment options aren't really treatment options in pets anyway. You know, you're not aiming to cure it ever. It's not like chemo in people because the side effects would be too bad. But there's so much you can do to help them. I find them some of the most rewarding cases. Sometimes awful and harrowing as well, but can be incredible. And what's really sad is that so many cancer cases are effectively sent home with the owner for them to wait for their dog to die. And nobody wants to wait for that. If you don't take the chemo, yeah, they might give you some steroids, but you're still not really doing anything to help. You're just trying to slow it by suppressing it a bit. Mm. But there is masses you can do for them. I They're great so. cases. Yeah, and a lot of younger dogs are, are seeing this, aren't we? And younger dogs. And, it's a shame and that's where I think nutrition is so important, because mm. I think if the diet is right for generations, like, I mean, if I was to buy a puppy instead of get rescue dogs or rehomed dogs, then I would want one that came from a few generations of raw fed dogs, ideally. Yeah. Because I think, it, you know, like the more disease that comes in younger and younger animals, that's something that's being inherited, something that Absolutely. we need to do something about earlier on in the line. And I posted on my Facebook page recently um, a study that they'd done where they were looking at um, what the puppy was fed and the incidence of ATP or allergic disease. And they found that in puppies fed raw food or a selection of different foods or even just some raw food, it was a hugely significant factor in the development of ATP. So the more raw food they had, the less ATP they had. Yeah, and if, yeah, the Helsinki yeah, the Helsinki one. one. It's a new yeah, piece of it's a new one. Yeah. There's an older, an older research actually. It's on the Naked Dog blog because I wrote about it um, from Sweden, where they're looking at only Westies, but okay. they're looking at ATP atopic Westies and yeah history of diet and, and what they had and, and what their parents had and yeah amazing yeah amazing. I read another one about what the bitch was fed during pregnancy and oh. if she was fed a selection of different yep. foods the puppies were less likely to have an atopic disease than if she was just fed the same bag of kibble <laughs> said we are what we eat. So, so the reason vets are so anti-war is because they just don't know any different because they're not taught anything. Hundred percent and what they're taught in the vet press is that raw food is really dangerous and yeah I mean uh, our lecturer who talked to us about nutrition told us that if you fed your dog raw your dog would die. <laughs> I thought someone would get horrendously more sick that way. So the vet, the vet argument for that, I can tell you what it is. So uh, it's a large breed dog, 
So the phosphorus calcium ratio. Yeah, it's to do with calcium and phosphorus ratio. But it is because some people will say, I feed raw, and you go, tell me what you feed. And they're like, well, I give them some beef mints and a bit yeah. of kidney, and you're like, okay. And they're like, yeah. And then, you know, maybe like a bit of chicken sometimes. And that is still raw food. It's still raw. Yeah. But that isn't what raw feeding is. It's not a balanced, complete diet. And some, if you're making it up yourself and you're going to feed it to your puppy, you need to know about raw and you need to know that you're getting that balance right. Because the deformities are all to do with the growing bones and the amount of calcium yeah. and phosphorus. And if you get it wrong, you can get quite bad deformities. But if you get it right, nothing. And you'll get even better, healthier bones. But actually, quite a lot of the kibble based products, even the high, I mean, more calories. Because they recommend, especially with the large bed, with the large breed dogs, they rec you know they keep pushing all the puppy stuff, and it's actually not got the right constitution for the large breeds. For the yeah. large breeds, so they push large or giant, and they're not giant or the Burmese, sorry. Um, so they're not a giant breed anyway. Really, they're a large breed, um, and when they push all the puppy stuff, you, you really shouldn't be on kids to go to an adult food because it's actually better because they're just lacking the mineral content, so they just haven't got mm -hmm. that level of it. And the, other, the yeah. other minerals that work with calcium and phosphorus anyway in the mineral wheel, because nothing works alone, they're, yeah. not too, they're not just balancing each other. You've got magnesium affects calcium and then you've got other things affecting the phosphorus. So what often happens in kibble is they're included in an unbioavailable form. So they might be in the bowl, yeah. but they're not going in the dog. So it's kind of uh, then upsetting the calcium phosphorus balance in the growing dog anyway because they don't have the other synergistic minerals. So you're, you're faced with either feeding that way, or I always remember something Nick used to say to me, Nick Thompson, you're feeding bone to grow bone. It's been bone. And then your dog breaks it down and remakes the bone. So it, all the components are there in a bioavailable form to then be bone again. So And I think in like a kibble food especially, it's gone through such high heat processing that even if you put yeah, you can put masses way. of nutrition in and I always laugh when it says that oh it includes glucosamine and chondroitin yeah. as like joint substance. So yeah but how much of that is actually still there? What's actually being absorbed by the dog? It's being added back in there because it's literally heated it to death that it's all completely there's no nutritional value in yeah. it. And I think what's great about the natural diets, particularly the raw, is so say you feed your puppy too much bone, it's just going to poop out more bone and do a more solid poo. Whereas with the kibble, it's just not going to get enough nutrition. Whereas if you give it too much nutrition with the raw, it's just going to poop out the excess. So you've not got a risk of over-nutritioning. <laughs> but you can definitely give them not enough with the, the much poorer foods. On that, how, how often do you advise feed? So with the dog, we're told um, to do it once a day or twice a day is what we're feeding. One in, one in the morning, yeah. one at night, it's 12 hours apart. Would it benefit him then? So where you were talking about if he takes too much on the body cat processing, would he benefit from four set times throughout the day so that his body... So it really, really depends on the dog, what you're feeding, and whether there's any disease. Some dogs do much better on less frequent meals, some do better on more frequent. If they've got a liver, a kidney, uh, acute pancreatic, something like that problem, little and often is better. If you're feeding a cooked food, then once or twice a day for your average healthy dog. Doesn't, I don't have a particular view on which is better or worse. But if you're feeding raw, I think you should just feed once a day. Just once a day? Yeah. So because it's, it takes about 20 hours for the raw to completely go through the gut. And if you look into the benefits of fasting as part of maintaining health, and in dogs, that's how they would have evolved to eat. You hunt, you feed, yeah. you feed, and then maybe you're a bit hungry because you haven't caught anything. So fasting then can, can create a lot of beneficial right. processes. Okay, well, I'm not massive on, on nutrition and so body, but I do know what I have been told about the human body, that if you consume anything more than 30, or 40, 30 to 35 grams of protein in one sitting, your body cannot absorb it. So if you say take on 70 grams of protein, it will instantly just flush through you and you cannot process that. Does a dog's internal workings work like a human's? 
No, they're, they're a little bit different, yeah. yeah. And it all depends as well. I suspect that's like an average thing because it depends how much proteases your pancreas produces, how good your digestive system is, yeah. how efficiently it's working, yeah. how quickly the food's moving through because of right. inflammation or whatever okay. else might be going on. Yeah. And in, there's so many different factors that are involved. You know, I spoke to one human nutritionist who said that people should have four to five hours of absolutely no food yeah. between each meal to allow the pancreas to rest and recover itself because otherwise in releasing digestive enzymes it digests a bit of itself and then it can't get it back unless you give it a break yeah. uh, but then in an acute pancreatic problem you want to feed little and often because otherwise it's too much for the pancreas to cope with right. but then in a chronic one once it's calmed down it's better to spread the meals again yeah. so it's it's kind of you're always having to find the balance point depending on what's happening within the system. Your advice would be then one large meal a day, so one, one large meal a day, thirty kilograms. It's always pestering. I mean, we've got a boxer. He loves it. And, absolutely, um, loves the food, and I can see the benefit in it. Yeah, he did, but they're always hungry all the time, even though they're gobble food. Really, they love it, but they're always, always up for food all, all day. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're way too much. So that's what you stop anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Were they like that yeah. one before on the process? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of dogs are like that. They wouldn't, they, they would turn up on their nose up on it, wouldn't they? They wouldn't eat oh, they would, the kibble, yeah. but they, they wouldn't eat some of it. Generally, if they love the raw, so they will have it any time of day. You can yeah. give it any time. Yeah. <laughs> so we're best off on one time of the day then. But to me, that feels as though I'm not doing him justice by being his owner and giving him two meals, you see. So it'd be weird for him to sit there at six o'clock but then you're not eating bone and bone takes a long time to digest and that's why the once a day is really good because then it gives the gut some rest time so it has that 20 hours for it to go in one end come out the other and then that four hours if you're just feeding once a day can be a rest time right and if they're always a pesterer my favorite thing with pestering dogs is to randomize their feeding time so like sometimes they have breakfast sometimes they have lunch Sometimes they have dinner, so they never quite know when you're about to stick some food down. Yeah. And then you can have different like <laughs> different lengths of fasting. So yeah. if you feed breakfast one day and dinner the next day, right. they've had a really nice long fasting time, but they're still eating once a day. Yeah. Yeah. I've got to remove every bowl from my kitchen. My dog just got bad. Yes. I think they're just leaving up on the surface to shut them up. I've always done random feeding with mine because I really, my parents' dogs are terrible. It gets close to six o'clock and they're just a complete pain in the bum. <laughs> My and so, yeah. start howling near six o'clock, right? He knew within five minutes he'd just start talking and howling. Yeah. No, see, I find that annoying. <laughs> so I'm like, nope, random times. <laughs> He. I did think it was a weird side effect of CBD. I know, I know, I know. It's a sort of transparency. What was it? Oh, they, things can sit in the stomach for an passed, exceptionally long passed, time. He must have passed just parts of it last year in October, so I kind of thought that it was all gone through. It hadn't, but she said it was part of the cell. She, she said it was actually because it's bone. It hadn't been like a big bone, um, I can think of recently, but it's probably it just been compacted down by the stomach like into a. Yeah. Did he have an open stomach open mm -hmm. surgery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. But also, I haven't plastic bag in there for three months. 
who can spread from the stomach well, to the yeah. liver because they're right next door. Yeah. So I'm just thinking, what could I do like support wise going forward? I haven't got them on anything at the moment. I'm just kind of sticking with what they've told me. I'm not giving them any supplements or anything at the minute. I will start to. So diet wise, I would stick bone free until at least 10 days post op. Yeah. Maybe two weeks. Fine because then you should have a properly healed wound. Yeah. And it's just not worth risking sticking no. any bone in there. Even ground carcass, okay. that's just better to just be bone free. It's not gonna do him any harm, a no. couple of weeks without yeah, any bone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, are you giving him anything for the liver? I can't remember. I was giving him milk thistle, so he's on that. I mean, he's obviously on the shed loads of drugs, so he's on like Methrodol, they've got him on... Um, what milk thistle are you giving? So I'd, I'd probably look at getting something in, and I mean it's difficult because we're trying to get other things in and see what he's reacting to for the epilepsy. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean ideally probably some kind of herb mix that's going to have some anti-inflammatory action, some liver support action, and just some, some gut healing yeah. support, so yeah. like calendula or something like that as well. Um, so with your milk thistle you could put in like dandelion root, um, we could do something like Shisandra, which is going to help support the overall system as well, because it's an adaptogen, but also very liver specific. Um, yeah, I think something like that, and maybe we do that before we try and put in the things for the epilepsy, because that's a chronic thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Email me about it, I'll make something up tomorrow. So have you seen any docs with epilepsy? Because I'm thinking of a few of my ex. Yeah, I see a lot of dogs oh, with epilepsy. Yeah. I um, my general experience has been if you can get them after their first, se first seizure or second or something like that then sometimes you can cure them with homeopathy um, especially if there's been a specific trigger incident like uh, it's been within a few months after vaccination um, or after a big incident within the home like a uh, loss of someone in the home or another pet or some kind of grief episode some kind of emotional disruption those ones can sometimes be cured completely um, if they've been epileptic for ages, on lots of medication for ages, then all I aim to do is try and lower dose rates if possible. Or a lot of them, people come to me because they want to minimise side effects. They've had to add in too many high doses of the epilepsy drugs mm -hmm. and their dog's just a space cadet yeah. continuously mm -hmm. and they don't want it to be like that. Um, or lots of liver problems relating to the medications because they're so strong. Obviously supporting the liver is one of the main things we do. Um, but there's lots of things you could do, they're, they're very individual cases and yeah. some I've had great success with, some not so much, but it's one of those diseases that the longer they've been treated, the harder it is to make a significant difference, unless it's just a quality of life, which you can nearly always help.